So we move on to the primary rules now. The primary rules for interpretation or those which operate as the external aids in interpretation. Let us take them one by one. If you remember them, there are six of them. Literal construction, actually, the principle or the primary rule of literal interpretation, harmonious interpretation, reasonable interpretation. So these rules of interpretation, we'll take them up one by one. But then before we start the essence of it, the basics, the primary rules for interpretation are external to the act. What is the basis of it? It is the experience of legal experts over a period of time. They are general and not specific. The operation of the rules must be considered with respect to the circumstance which is being dealt with for interpretation. And therefore, all of them are different but complementary to each other. So, which of the rules is applicable in a particular context is a matter of judicial expertise. How do you decide which rule is to be applied in an interpretation? Now, we'll take the rules but before them. I need to spend a little time with how do you deal with the primary rules as far as your examination is concerned. I want you to understand or consider four or five aspects dealing with the primary rules in the examination questions. No, number one, the primary rules are best explained in a question using examples. There are examples lying scattered across the acts in India. Even if it is an act that you do not know, if a primary rule can be applied in a provision that you are aware of, please use examples unless examples are used because in my explanation here, I am going to take up examples for each of them. So using examples, the primary rules can be easily explained, not only explained, can be understood. It is important to know, but it is more important in my opinion to show that you know something. Knowing is not enough. Showing that you know is more important as far as your examination is concerned. So the primary rules are best explained in a question. Whether the question is direct or indirect, use examples, use examples, like how I have done, not necessarily the same examples. I'm not asking you to mug up the same examples. From your experience with the other statutes that you study, pick up examples left, right and center and use them. So these are the primary rules best explained with examples. And for that purpose, you are at liberty to lift examples from any of the acts. If you would have noticed in our past uh, learning exercises. I have moved into the Income Tax Act. I have moved into the Companies Act. I have moved into the labor laws like the Bonus Act or the Gratuity Act, the Competition Act. You can lift examples from anywhere. In fact, there are some very good examples in the Companies Act and the Income Tax Act. So when you, when you have the necessity to use examples, you need not restrict yourself to one or two laws. There is a multitude of laws in India. So when you're picking up your examples, pick them up from any of the laws that you are aware of. But please ensure that your examiner knows the act that you're taking an example of. So you're at liberty to lift examples from any of the acts which you may have studied to explain the importance of the rules. Now the basic problem with this chapter. Why this chapter? The basic problem with the paper on laws the paper on auditing, the paper on indirect taxes at the final level. Now, the problem with all these subjects of this chapter in particular, as a student, is that it is very easy to understand it, whereas very difficult to express it. It is very easy to understand it when you read through it once. Okay, this is what it is. This is how it is staged. I have got it. But when you take a practical problem or a question from the examination and try to answer it, you find a gap between what you know and what you can show that you know. So understand, recognize or acknowledge that the chief problem with this chapter is expressing it, not understanding it. So the problem with this chapter as a student 
He is that it is very easy to understand it, but very difficult to write it down or express it in the examination in the way it should be done. Therefore, do not assume that you know a concept, that you know a rule, that you know an aid. Instead, try to write it down in decently acceptable language. So after going through, let us say, literal construction, or after understanding what is an explanation, what is the role of Ejusdem generis, pick up a question or frame a question for yourself, and then try to answer it in a decently acceptable kind of a language. So writing practice will help you a lot. The more you write, the more you are exam ready. Don't just read it and leave it off. Try to take a question, take a question from the past examinations, frame a question for yourself, pick up a question from your study material, a practice manual question. Take up a question from somewhere after studying a particular unit and then try to write it down in decently acceptable language. Writing it down is also not sufficient. You need to get it endorsed by a person who is a professional in that field. So keep writing it, getting it reviewed by a person. So, do not assume that you just know a concept instead. Try to write it down in decently acceptable language. Please apply these cardinal principles for the examination. So, this, this is one chief problem that you will find in this, in this particular chapter. Primary rules are exam, uh, use examples. Lift examples from any act. Easy to understand but difficult to express. Writing practice, writing practice. I keep repeating this. It's the old Indian adage. Writing once is equal to reading 20 times. So as far as possible, write down whatever you know or pick up questions and try to answer them and get them reviewed also. Now, coming to the rules, as I told you, I repeat what I said, I re-emphasize. All these primary rules are primary rules for interpretation. So it is not justified, it is not correct to use the suffix construction, but that is exactly what has been done. So I am following what has been done Therefore, the word construction appears. So, the first primary rule for interpretation is literal construction. Literal construction is a principle which teaches you, read a provision of law literally as it is. That is why the word literal. So, what does it say? A law is meant to be interpreted verbatim. That is in the same sense as it is drafted. Don't replace it. Don't replace a synonym, the meaning might change. Don't read a word in place of another word. So a law is meant to be interpreted in the same sense as it is drafted. You remember the example that I took of section 49.1 of the Income Tax Act. The advance money received and forfeited shall be reduced from the cost of acquisition on ultimate transfer of the asset. You can't supply words there. That would become construction. So a law is meant to be interpreted verbatim or in the same sense as it has been drafted by the lawmakers or the drafters. However, if an interpretation can be made which is wide and narrow at the same time, in one perspective, I can make a wide interpretation. In another perspective, it's a narrow interpretation that results. Then, the wider interpretation must be adopted. There are various examples for this in the Act. I have taken one here. An example lifted from the Companies Act 2013. The explanatory statement sent along with the notice for a general meeting at which a special resolution or business is to be transacted shall also inter alia specify the nature of interest of any director or key managerial personnel in that business or resolution. Let me bring it down to common man's language. At a general meeting of a company, if you propose to pass a special resolution with respect to a matter, or the resolution is ordinary but the business is special, meetings and proceedings, that chapter of your company's act is what I am dealing with. Then, the notice which is sent to the members for the purpose of inviting them for that general meeting shall be annexed to, shall be, shall be supplemented with an explanatory statement 
the explanatory statement is mandatory to be attached to the notice which is sent to a general meeting at which a special resolution or a special business is proposed to be passed or transacted. Now, this explanatory statement includes a lot of details about that particular resolution of business. It tells you what is the resolution, why is it to be passed, what happens if it is not passed, what if what is its impact, what is the consequence on the members of the company, on the company as such. And apart from all this, there is a requirement that if any director or key managerial personnel of the company is interested in that business or resolution, that must be brought out or specified. So the explanatory statement highlights the nature of interest of a director or key managerial personnel in the business or the resolution. This is the provision. Now when you say nature of interest, nature of interest can be construed narrowly it can also be construed in a broader sense. For example, the nature of interest, for example, if it is a contract involving an amount involved, that is a financial criterion. The interest here, the nature of interest that we are referring to here, is it financial interest or is it any interest including financial interest? Is a big matter of concern, it's a big interpretation blockade. Now, in this provision, the word, the phrase nature of interest does not mean only financial interest, but any interest of such an officer in the matter, any interest of such a director or key managerial personnel in that matter. Let me extend the example a little further. I am a director in a company and I am also a partner in a firm in which my wife is the other partner. The company proposes to enter into a transaction with that firm. This is, let us say, a related party transaction. A related party transaction might require a special resolution. A special resolution requires a notice to be sent for the meeting. The notice requires to be supplemented with an explanatory statement. There, I have an interest in this transaction. The company of which I am a director proposes to enter into a transaction for supply or purchase of goods with a partnership firm in which I am a partner also. So I am interested in the transaction. If I as a director am interested, the members of the company must be informed that I am interested. So the nature of my interest in this transaction must be brought out on the explanatory statement. Now you will see that this interest is not financial. It is a relationship interest. Even that must be brought out. So when I literally construct or literally interpret this particular provision, nature of interest is any interest including financial interest. So you can see that this is a clear example in which the nature of interest can be misinterpreted or interpreted narrowly. The wider interpretation and the narrower interpretation. Wider interpretation is to be preferred. You can see that that is the actual intent of the parliament behind making the provision. Otherwise, a director will escape this provision by claiming that it is only financial interest which the section requires it. I will not disclose it. I will not mention that in the explanatory statement. That is a method of hoodwinking the shareholders by giving a narrow meaning to this phrase. So nature of interest means any interest, including financial interest, not necessarily financial interest only. The second principle, the second primary rule for interpretation, harmonious construction, my favorite. Harmonious construction is very, very important as a practicing professional. Harmony, uniformity, merging. Reading together is harmonious construction. Just take an example when the same subject matter, the same motive, the same purpose is dealt with 
in different provisions or chapters of an act. A combined effect must be given to all such provisions in resolving that matter. You are dealing with the financial statements. Different provisions of the act deal with financial statements. How should they be prepared? When should they be submitted? When should they be sent to, for approval to the members of the company? So the aspect relating to financial statements is dealt with in different parts when it is to be prepared by a company under the Companies Act. So when the same subject matter is dealt with in different provisions or chapters of an act. Now, why different provisions or chapters of an act in different acts also? Then you must give a combined effect to all such provisions in resolving that matter. Now, I have taken an example here of the time limits of a general meeting, of an annual general meeting. Again, I am borrowing or I am lifting an example from the Companies Act. While the various time limits for holding the AGM of a company are provided in Section 96 of the Companies Act 2013, Section 129 also provides that audited financial statements shall be presented before every AGM of the company. Time limits for the AGM. Now let me see if you are able to recollect your Companies Act here. What are the various time limits within which a company must hold its nth AGM? Second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth and so on. An AGM of a company is held for a financial year, please remember. The AGM of a company must be held within a time limit which is in cumulative effect given by three time limits, section 96. One, the gap between two successive AGMs shall not exceed 15 months. Two, the AGM for a financial year shall be held within six months from the close of the financial year. Number three, every calendar year must see an AGM of a company being held. So 15 months, six months, calendar year. Three time limits are prescribed for the AGM to hold the AGM of a company and no company is exempt from it. Now, number one, all these three must be read together. It is not either or or. It is this and this and this. So all the three of them have a cumulative impact. So if the date of conducting the AGM, the second AGM is given to you and you are asked to fix the time for the third AGM, you have to align these dates and take the earliest of them in order to achieve simultaneous compliance. That is as far as section 96 is concerned. Section 129 of the Companies Act says that the audited financial statements shall be presented before every AGM of the company. Now, reading them in tandem, what does it mean? By the time you fix the date for the AGM, the audited financial statements must be ready. And they must be presented before every AGM. Now, the word before here itself has an interpretation issue. When I say before, before has two meanings. Before meaning number one, in front of. Before meaning number two, before in time. A chronology. Which one am I referring to here? I am referring to the first meaning here. Audited financial statements must be exhibited before the members at the AGM. Of course, it will not be exhibited on a screen. It will be there, available. Any member in the meeting can come up and inspect the financial statements. You can see them if you have not received them. In the normal course, you would have received them with the annual report. So, when time limits are prescribed by one section, and another section talks about Audited financial statements being presented before every AGM, read them together. Harmoniously constructed. When you construct it harmoniously, it will mean that by the time the date is fixed in accordance with section 96, 
the financial statements must have completed the audit exercise also. Now, the, the, the matter is about the financial statements being ready as a subjective criteria, while the three time limits are objective criteria. So, when the AGM is held, financial statements audited must be ready. And I suppose you remember you are able to connect this with the Companies Act. What ex exactly happens to the sequence of financial statements? Financial statements are prepared. After preparation of the financial statements by the Accounts Department, by the Finance Department, they are approved by the Board of Directors. Approved by the Board of Directors. Then they are audited by the auditors. And then they are adopted by the members at the AGM. So, the financial statements of a year pass through four such stages. Preparation, approval, audit, adoption. Preparation is rudimentary, it is clerical. So, financial statements pass through three stages involving the three A's. Adoption, audit and approval in the reverse order. Or in the ascending order, Approval, audit, adoption. So even the adoption or I, I mean the audit must be completed at the AGM at which these financial statements are to be adopted by the members of the company. What is adopting? Adopting financial statements means agreeing or acknowledging, uh, acknowledging those financial statements as the financial statements of the company for that financial year. So this is an example for harmonious construction in fixing up the time limit or the date by which the nth AGM of a company must be held. So the harmonious construction is the second rule. Therefore, the audited financials must be ready when the AGM is conducted. When during the time the AGM is being conducted, it must be ready. And what? Not the unaudited financial statements, the audited financial statements. Coming to the next, which is reasonable construction. So literal construction, Harmonious construction. Now we come to reasonable interpretation, not construction. Reasonable interpretation. When the terminology in a provision of an act is amenable to, is susceptible to multiple interpretation, interpretation shall be made in a manner which is reasonable in the context to which it relates. Very, very natural. I don't have to have a rule for this. It is reasonable to acknowledge that there is a rule of reasonable construction. I repeat, when the terminology in a provision of an act is amenable to multiple interpretation, you can interpret it differently or different forms of interpretation can be given to a word. You must interpret it in a manner which is reasonable in the context to which it relates. What is reasonable differs from case to case very subjective and wherever subjectivity is involved that is where your diligence is required your professional expertise is required so when the terminology in a provision of an act is amenable to multiple interpretation interpretation shall be made in a manner which is reasonable in the context to which it relates now how do i explain this with an example i'm taking an example of the term fraud for literal construction, I used an example of nature of concern or interest. For harmonious construction, I took up the example of time limits for the AGM. Here I am coming to a word, fraud. Very violent word. It's an extreme. Fraud indicates or fraud presupposes an element of culpable state of mind. There is an intention of carrying out a non-compliance. Look at the difference between the word fraud and good faith as defined in section 3 of the General Clauses Act. Fraud is the other end of the rainbow. So taking an example of that particular term, fraud is used in almost all statutes in India. Fraud detection, fraud prevention is the objective of any act ultimately as the background of the spinal cord. So if you take the word fraud which is used in multiple acts, 
how do you interpret this though the word fraud has not been defined in the companies act why it is not even defined in the general clauses act fraud of course it does have a meaning in common business practices of india but then you take the dictionary meaning there is a culpable intention to defraud a person the intention is to commit something but do something else so though the word fraud has not been defined in the companies act the term must be interpreted in such a way as to mean a deliberate and compulsive attempt to cause a loss to the company or the business enterprise and not mere or genuine mistakes made by officers of the company a genuine mistake cannot be called fraud to take action for example under section 447 of the companies act 2037 to 2013 so fraud involves a culpable state of mind that is an intent to carry out a defrauding act so although the word fraud has not been defined in the companies act wherever it is used in interpreting the word it must be interpreted in such a manner as to mean a deliberate a compulsive attempt to cause a loss it could be financial loss property loss loss of life any loss to the company and not mere or genuine mistakes made by officers of the company in other words don't call a genuine mistake a fraud that is not reasonable interpretation fraud must be interpreted in very strong terms there must be clear indications so this is reasonable construction or reasonable interpretation coming to the fourth rule the primary rules for construction the fourth of them the beneficial construction beneficial construction or interpretation is interpretation of a provision beneficially and this is done in a very logical legal sequence beneficial construction also called the hayden's rule hayden must have been a legal expert who put forth this kind of a rule and has been given his name so also called the hayden's rule it is a procedural and a systematic approach to interpretation analyzing an interpretation problem into four distinct parts especially when a law is silent on a matter or may appear ambiguous in light of when this rule is the favorite of the supreme court in dealing with lawsuits so what is a beneficial construction or beneficial interpretation rule convey it is a procedural and systematic approach it's not a rule it's an approach it's an approach to interpretation it analyzes the interpretation problem that you're facing into four different parts and this arises especially when the law is silent on a matter or may appear ambiguous now what are these four parts we will come to it deals with the progress of laws over a period of time how has the companies act progressed over 1912 1922 1956 2013 2017 2017 the latest companies amendment act of 2017 how has this law progressed with respect to a particular provision is analyzed so analyzing the progressive thinking of the lawmakers we break up the problem into four stages very interesting what are these four stages step number 1 what was the law before the provision or the act there was a law that law was deficient that is why we have to beneficially construct so what was the law before the provision or the act was made analyze that first moving on to the next the second what was the mischief for the loophole which that law did not provide for okay this was a related party transaction which is a deficiency the act did not provide for a related party transaction there was no provision in the law to prevent or to report or to notice related party transactions so that was a mischief or loophole which directors could have misused so what was the law before the provision or the act number 1 what was the mischief or the loophole which that law did not provide for number 
Number three, what is the new or the amended provision or remedy of the new law? What is the new law suggesting as a remedy? How is it that this malady can be remedied? So that is step three. And fourthly, what is the reason for that remedy or the new provision? Beautifully laid down four stages by which an interpretation problem can be logically handled. No wonder it was a favorite of the Supreme Court. So the four steps to the problem, what was the law before the provision or the act? What was the mischief or the loophole that that law did not provide for? What is the new or the amended provision or solution or remedy for the malady? And what is the reason for the remedy? How does this remedy actually correct the malady? So when you analyze it in four stages, that becomes beneficial construction. You will understand that this has very limited application. You can't apply this everywhere. You have to be very selective about this. This is a very strong tool. So literal construction, harmonious construction, reasonable construction, beneficial construction. We have covered four primary rules for interpretation actually as I, I, I keep feeling bad about using the word construction. It's actually interpretation. So the next one is exceptional construction. Very interesting and we have seen examples of this. I would like to you to correlate this with the General Clauses Act. General Clauses Act has dealt with a host of these issues. What is the rule of exceptional construction? Now, let us acknowledge that there are instances under any statute when a directory provision, mandatory provision, sorry, a directory provision is a discretionary provision. There are instances under any statute when a directory provision may is inserted in respect of a procedure instead of a mandatory provision. How will a mandatory provision be worded shall or must? Directory provision may or the vice versa. But the intention of the legislature is the reverse. Now that is interesting. If you want to use the word may, why don't you use the word may here? Why should you use the word shall? When you want to use the word shall, why don't you use the word shall? That will settle the problem once and for all. But in some cases, this is not possible. For reasons, I am coming to a little later. There are instances under any statute when a directory provision in the form of the word may is inserted in respect of a procedure instead of a mandatory provision, shall or must, or the other way around also. But the intention of the legislature is the reverse. Although the word may is used, the actual intent, the power of the word may should be read as shall. Or where shall is used, shall must be read as may. This kind of an interpretation problem arises in most of the statutes or most of the provisions. So when is exceptional construction used? They are used in instances where under a statute, a directory provision is inserted in respect of a procedure instead of a mandatory provision or the vice versa, but the parliamentary intention of the legislature is the reverse. It is the opposite. Where a directory provision must be read as a mandatory provision or a mandatory provision must be read as a directory provision. Taking an example for this, therefore in certain cases, may shall be read as shall or the vice versa or may have the impact of and in certain provisions. Taking an example for this, this the, the right example for this exceptional construction is provisions relating to the governance, to the government. Provisions relating to the government or statutory authorities always contain the directory provision since the government is always above the law. And a mandatory provision relating to the government can never be made. I cannot, while making the Companies Act or the Income Tax Act, order the government to do something. I only empower the government to do something. How can you order the government? So instead of ordering the government, very diplomatically, we empower the government. Now it is the duty of the government to understand that when that 
circumstantial provision arises or when the circumstance indicated by the provision arises the government must be stern they shall do it although the provision says may so with respect to provisions or powers of the government we always say the government may do it i can't say the government shall do it because i can't government is above me it is superior now extending the example to be a little more focused or concentrated if the affairs of the sebi are being carried out in a manner detrimental to public interest sebi as a body is being hijacked officers of the sebi are not working properly sebi has a virus in operation so the sebi is working out it is carrying out its activities or discharging its duties detrimental to public interest it is affecting public interest when it is established to protect the investor community then the central government may supersede it supersede is a very nice word supersede is set aside and take the powers off what does this statement what does this legal provision uh, imply for a common man how do you explain this for a common man if the sebi is being mismanaged the government can ask the officers of the sebi to go home and ensure that they take over the management of the sebi so supersession is a nice remedy to closing down so instead of closing down the affairs of the sebi i ask the officers to go home you people are mismanaging it please go home we will manage the sebi central government takes over the reins of the sebi that is supersession so if the affairs of the sebi are being carried out in a manner detrimental to public interest the central government may supersede it this implies that in case of mismanagement of affairs of the sebi the central government must supersede it provision uses the word may central government cannot sit back and relax and let us see let us see how far they go no so if the affairs of the sebi are being carried out in a manner detrimental to public interest central government may supersede it in this particular provision please read may as must or shall so it's a directory provision that is used but that directory provision has mandatory effect when the circumstance arises so this implies that in case of mismanagement of affairs the central government must supersede it that's an example to illustrate exceptional construction moving on to our next one the last principle we have completed the literal construction harmonious construction reasonable construction and this exceptional construction now coming to ejusdem generis ejusdem generis you can make out from the word it is not an english word it's it, it the phrase is latin as a latin phrase ejusdem generis only means of a specific species or family or genus now it it so happens that in various instances of an act a list is opened up a list is opened up with a species or a family of units and that list is left open ended where the government wants it can add anything else to the list or as the circumstances necessitate it you can add a component to the list in such a case this open ended list must be closed only with items or units of the same nature or classification units of the same species so as in latin phrase ejusdem generis only means of a specific species or family this rule means that or it requires that where a provision enumerates a list and leaves the list open ended with the use of the words or any other the list must be closed only with the units of the same species as are given in the list now there are so many cases like this income tax for example the definition of the word person although it is not left open ended 
person means and includes an individual, an HUF, a company, a firm, a body of individuals. Now, suppose it was left open-ended. I will close it only with a unit, which is an entity, earning taxable income, and not any other item or any, any other unit. So, HUF then generous only says, when you are closing an open-ended list, so one, there should be a list, two, the list must be open-ended, leaving a residuary category. That residuary category can be utilized only for other units having the same features or characteristics of those which are already mentioned in the list or enlisted. So the rule provides that where a provision enumerates a list and leaves the list open-ended with the use of the words or any other at the end of it, that list must be closed or utilized only with the units of the same species as given in the list. Taking an example for this, section 2H. Section 2H is something I have used before in the General Clauses Act for the definition of the term security. The best definition of the word security is given in the SCRA because it deals with securities in, in fact. It specializes in securities contracts. It's an act to regulate contracts and securities. So section 2H one clause of the interpretation section, section 2 of the SCRA. Section 2H of the SCRA, which defines the term security, enlists, shares, debentures, units of a mutual fund, units of the UTI, derivatives, etc. And finally mentions any other security or instrument. Now, in interpreting the term security, in that residuary last category, documents which are similar in characteristics to the enlisted items only shall be used to close the list and not any other units like fixed assets or inventories. They don't have the characteristics of a security. A security is a document. A security is transferable. A security entitles a person to various rights. These rights come coupled with obligations. So a document which satisfies all these characteristics only can be included in that category by the government subsequently when you are using this. So securities have certain features. These features must be fulfilled by every unit which is proposed to be included in the list for the purpose of closing that open-ended list. So that list is open-ended. So in order to ensure that the list is closed, please close it with items or units having the same features of the other securities already mentioned there. That picture that I have there, you have people of the same communi community, birds of a feather flock together. I have a debenture which I have illustrated. These are the characteristics of a debenture. Similarly, plant and machinery, spare parts, etc. They all form one genus or one species. So whenever a list is there and the list is open-ended, there is a residuary category. This category can accommodate other units. Then please accommodate those units only which have the same features or characteristics as the others. That is the rule of Ejusdem Generis. Thank you. We will continue with our next class.